um, I guess this is part three of a one-week message that, uh, I don't know, it's going to happen that way, but we're going to talk about uh, power for ministry, and it's probably going to go on beyond this week, too, just because I've uh, found a vein that I'm really enjoying, and we'll keep going on this for a while. But um, anyway, let's pray, and we'll get into, uh, get into a message this morning. Father God, we bless you. Father, I thank you for awesome worship and great testimonies. I thank you, Father God, that the house is alive and you're doing good things here. And I pray, Father, that your word would, would touch us and challenge us today, that we would be more like you. Father, we bless you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, I started on uh, talking about Peter being in jail and how the Lord supernaturally opened some doors for him, but then he showed up at the house where the church was praying and the door would not be opened and he was outside, and how sometimes God does something really miraculous and amazing, and sometimes we have to do something mundane, and wisdom is when you know the difference. And we get ourselves into trouble when we start trusting our own abilities and our own self, and we power through things that we really weren't supposed to be involved with anyway. And so we've been talking about the balance between divine action and human action, the balance between spiritual power and human power and not messing them up. You can look at the uh, podcasts online for the last two weeks if you feel like that is uh, something you need more of, but the, our, our base concept is out of Philippians 3.3, 3, where it says that um, we serve God by His Spirit, who boasts in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. We put no confidence in the flesh. So just a real quick, real quick recap of last t- uh, two weeks' worth of message points. Um, Point number one was that spiritual impartation is more important than preaching personality. Point number two was success is obeying Jesus, not having good numbers. Point three is trust the Lord more than your own ability to push. And point number four was people aren't perfect and we shouldn't pretend that we are because we're not. And those were, those were kind of our points for the last couple of weeks. Um, so we're getting into uh, new material today, so I'm just going to jump in and give you point number five. And, and again, this is, um, this, is my, this is the way I think. This is our ministry paradigm. This is how we try to, uh, try to run church. So point number five is we need to figure out between impressing people or empowering people. As leadership, as ministers, are we trying to impress people or are we trying to empower people? That's the question. And I lean very, very heavily towards the empower people side of things. See, our, our job as ministers is not to do the ministry, but to empower people to do the ministry. Okay, uh, like Ephesians chapter four talks about the the fivefold ministry: the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. They are to equip the saints to do the ministry. They are not to do the ministry. And a lot of times we get wound up in doing you know, oh here's the evangelist, let him lead everybody to Jesus. But the evangelist should be training us to be evangelists, to reach people. Oh, here's the prophet. Let him prophesy over everybody. Yeah, but the prophet should be training people to prophesy in their, in their workplace and in their schoolhouse because the ministers are designed to train people up to do the work of the ministry, to bring the church to perfection. I see Jesus modeling this for us, if you will, in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, that says, when Jesus called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. See, Jesus did not say, all right, 12, come here. I'm the coolest guy on the planet. You must just just help me out. Bring me water, you know, fan me because we haven't invented air conditioning yet. You know, I'll snap my fingers, bring, bring me grapes. It wasn't like that at all. Jesus said, hey, guess what? I'm the Son of God, and I am giving you power to do what I'm doing. Jesus, in fact, said, greater things will you do in my name. 
And, and, and so we as church, we as Christian people need to understand that our, our job is to replicate ministry and do ministry. Not sit there and watch somebody else do ministry. If your, if your version of Christianity is, let me show up and, and you know, see a good show, then you're missing it. Let me, let me show up and, you know, oh, I want Zach to sing to me and that's going to be cool. And you know, I want to see lights and that'll be cool. And I'm going to go home and just keep doing what I'm doing. That, you're, we're missing Christianity. Christianity is about us doing the ministry in our world. I can swing by your business, but you're there all day. I can go to your school, but you're there all day. I can visit you in your neighborhood, but you're there all day. And your job is to do ministry everywhere that you are. See, the problem that I see in, in Christianity in the modern context is that when ministry is about the pastor impressing you, then you become a follower of that pastor. And then that pastor either falls, retires, or dies, and everything that they built falls apart. That's not what Christianity was meant to be like. See, my job as, as pastor is to empower you so that you're a follower of Jesus, not to impress you so that you follow me. Is, is this making any sense for you guys? See, this is something that's, that's re really important to me. So, like, when we have, we have our prayer team at the, at the altar, you may notice that unless there's just, like, a huge line of people, I usually don't pray for people at the altar. The prayer team prays for people at the altar. Why? Because I want to give away ministry. I want to empower them to pray for people, not impress you with how good I pray. See, we could, line, we could do it where, you know, we line everybody up and I pray over everybody. And if the Lord tells me to do it exactly like that, I would. But for the most part, God has told me, empower others to do ministry. So prayer team, they would come, they would, they would pray for you. And so instead of me praying for 20 people, I got 20 people praying for 20 people. And I think that's healthier. I think that's the Christ model for us today. When I, when I look at Scripture, I see things like in, um, in Psalm 127, verse 4, this speaks to fathers or families. It says, like the arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. And the concept here for a family is that, if I, that I, my wife and I, should have a quiver of arrows that can launch and do more than we can do ourselves. But I, I think that same concept is true for church. Because I am not the only arrow. We are all arrows. And so our job at, at, as New Covenant Church is to train you and prepare you so that when you go and you're walking through your factory or you're walking through the store that you're shopping at, or when you are on the sales floor at your business, whatever it is that it looks like, when you're walking through um, Landrum looking for something good to eat, they still call it Landrum? No? Okay. What, what's it with Dining Commons? Eddie, what's it called? Dining Commons. You, how many of you guys ate at Landrum? Okay. We're the old people. So when you're, um, when you're walking through the dining commons looking for something to eat and the Holy Spirit says, hey, turn, over, turn here and, and talk to that person, your first response should be yes. Not, oh, I better call the pastor. I better call the pastor so that he can talk to this person. No, because I'm not there. Does this make sense? If we empower you to do ministry, then the kingdom of God is alive. If we impress you, ooh, look at him, he preaches good. Look at him, he does worship good. If we impress you, then you're going to be, you're a consumer. You're sitting back and watching. And I don't want to say that I hate consumer Christianity, but I extremely dislike consumer Christianity. Because then we're just sitting around watching. It's like going to the movies. 
We are movie consumers. But we shouldn't be Christian consumers. We should be disciples. Because disciples actually do stuff. We should, we should, as leadership, we should be thinking like John the Baptist. who said, you know, hey, I must decrease so that Jesus can what? Increase. So I, as pastor, I am continually trying to decrease so that you guys can increase. Because I want to empower you the way Jesus empowered not impress you with how, how cool I am. And, and, and guys, I, I've, we've been there. We used, to, uh, we used to be on staff in a mega church. Man, they, when I preached, they made me wear makeup because it was about impressing. I hated it. It's like you meet, meet the makeup artist in the back before service, and they do little touch-ups and trip, clip your hair and all this stuff to get you ready. I'm just like, bleh. I'm pretty like I am. I don't need makeup. Amen. Thank you, honey. I'll give you a dollar later. That was awesome. So, so, so everybody understands. So if, if at any point in, in church life at New Covenant, you're looking back going, hey, why are these people, you know, why are these people praying for me and not the pastor? Hear me. I'm absolutely doing that on purpose. Because I want to empower each of you to do ministry, not watch me do it. And truthfully, you get more joy. How many of you guys have put your kids in, in little kids' sports at some point? Okay. I love watching my children compete in little kids' sports. You know, when they kick the ball good, it's, it is more joyful to me watching my kids do good in little kids' sports than doing it myself. That is the joy. When, you, when your kids score goals, of course, I used to pay my kid, I used to pay Zach to score goals. That's how, that's how we, that's, I figured they do it in the pros, right? I mean, he was a professional athlete when he was like six. Buck a goal, was that what it was? Would you, you bought a PS3 with your goals, soccer goal money? He was big time. Anyway. What are you doing here? That was point number five, right? So here's point number six. Before I wander off and get in trouble. Here's point number six. We should make word-based life choices, not world-based life choices. There are, quite unfortunately, a whole lot of churches that don't do a whole lot of Bible they talk about important things like justice, which is important, but they don't use the Scripture. I was, I was, as a new Christian, I was on staff at a church that was very much like that. I will not say what flavor it was, but they, they would give you the curriculum magazine, and you would use that. And when I would deviate from the curriculum magazine and actually use the Holly Bibble, Man, I got in trouble. I got fired from a church for using the Bible too much. Pretty scary. And there are, I'm just telling you, there are churches like that. And, and so we as Christians, we have to make a decision. And this is part of, part of my ministry understanding. Are we going to be worldly based or word based? Are we gonna are we gonna run our, our stuff based on what we you know oh they you know they got great you know they got great lights and this is great psychology and this is what it, and that's how we're gonna pull it pull everybody together or are we gonna say this is what the Bible says and this is what we should do? I believe that the scriptures are absolutely foundational to everything. Who should you marry? The Bible is gonna tell you. It's not going to say, you know, Sally is not in here. But it's going to give you enough parameters that you know, you know, do not be unequally yoked. Right? There's enough parameters in here that you know who not to marry. What should I do with my life? There's enough in here that's going to, that's going to guide you in those decisions. And we need to be 
scripturally based in everything that we do. Oh, you use the Bible all the time. Yeah, I do. Let that be your criticism of me that everything we do is about the Bible. Every time we have a sermon, I just write down all these Bible verses. Well, good. That's what we're supposed to be doing. See, the Bible is not a pile of random stories that some person decided to stick together and, you know, this makes a nice, you know, nice little collection of short stories. That is not the Bible. The Bible is a single comprehensive revelation of God's divine purpose and God's divine plan. And from Genesis to Revelation, there is a cohesive thought that goes through that is, that's life-giving for us. It's all-encompassing. It gives us everything that we need. Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is alive. The Word of God is active. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates your heart even to divide your soul and your spirit, your joints and your marrow, and it judges your thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. See, the Word of God is awesome. And we should be lovers of the Word. It should, it should never be, oh man, I got to, I got to read the Bible. Oh, such a it should be, wow, this is, this is a love note to you from the one who loves you more than any person you've ever met. If your sweetheart gave you a letter, <laughs> ah, it smells, it smells like her, right? Your sweetheart gave you a letter. Would you toss it in the back seat? Drive around for six months, never open it? No. If your sweetheart gave you a letter, you would find a spot as soon as possible. You could... Oh. <laughs> and your heart would race, right? And you'd keep it. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you keep it? I was, um, I think it was Friday, I um. Decided, I decided it was time to clean my closet. Get rid of some of the, the clothes that don't fit me anymore because I've lost weight and get rid of clothes that are like a million years old that I'm just not going to wear them anymore or just whatever and I'm piles and piles of t-shirts. And so I start, clean, I start cleaning through my stuff and guess what I found? Love notes. And I sat there and I read them. And it's like, oh wow, this is like five years old. This five years old, my wife tells me how much she loves me, how sweet I am. Ah, here's another one. And, oh, that's so cute. And I kept them. Why, why would you keep a card? Because it's an expression of love. Why would we dig in this? Man, every time I have a chance, I sit out at my house and I read and I read and I read. And it's like you find this and, oh, that connects back to this. And you start connecting the dots. And that's, that's the love. When we say that the Bible is alive and active, that means that you can read a passage and come back next year and read the same passage and it speaks to a different thing. It's not Shakespeare. Right? Shakespeare, you know, okay, cool, you know, 500 years ago you wrote some cool plays, you know, thumbs up Shakespeare. But it doesn't speak to you. The Word of God's alive, and when you get into it, it just it pokes at different stuff. Hey, what you said yesterday that was kind of rude, boom. It's like, oh, how did they know that 2,000 years ago when they wrote this stuff? How did they know? Because it's alive, and it's active, and it's sharp, and it penetrates. So we are always going to be about the Word. Our ministry focus is always going to be about the Word. We are always going to, we live in a world of, of identifications. We identify, uh, we took Ian to a university to check it out. We identify as a liberal arts university. It's like, well, why, why do we even say it that way? I mean, I don't know, but I'm just going to tell you that I identify as a Bible-believing Christian. Okay, that's what I do. And the scripture is going to speak that way through us in this church. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you guys cool stories, three points and a poem. 
I'm going to stand up here and tell you what the Word of God says. And if the Word of God offends you, we'll smile because you needed it. Okay? And, and, and we, we love the Scripture because it's true. And that truth is power. So let us know, let us know that we are going to be a word-based, not a world-based ministry. That is the way we are. And this is actually the seventh and seventh <laughs> math, whatever, seventh point of this little thing that I thought was going to take one week, and it didn't. But seventh point is this. Do we use gimmicks to attract or the presence of God to change people? Are we chasing gimmicks to attract people or the presence of God to change lives? And I will tell you, there's a lot of places that use gimmicks. Right? Whoever invites their, the most friends gets a pair of you know, earbuds, and whoever does this gets this, and there's all these little gimmicks. And you know, I, I read about a church that you know, bring a visitor, and we'll give that visitor a crisp new $10 bill and, and whatever. And so um, we're not doing that. But um, there's all these different things that are gimmicks to attract people. But we're, we, New Covenant, we are not into gimmicks. We're into the presence. And see, I, I believe with all my heart that the presence of God changes your life. I want people to walk in, and I've heard this so many times from people, I want you to walk in the, the front door and, and people just say, wow, I sense that God was here. Yes. That's what we want. That's what it's all about. Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your gimmick. No. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. See, we live in a world today where people are hurting and they have problems and they're confused and they're tense and they're stressed. And having another gimmick is not going to fix anything. What's going to fix something is the joy of God in, in His presence. That when we come into His presence and it's just like, oh, I can breathe. I don't know what's going to, I don't know how my problems are going to get worked out, but I know who's going to help me work it out. Does that make sense? And so we are very much a presence-driven church. Uh, it, it, God is here is, my, is like my target. Which means everything that we're doing is about keeping the clutter out, keeping the confusion out, keeping the distractions out, so that all we, all we have left is the presence of God. I want to be in a place where the, man, just the glory of God is manifesting. And so, and so why, do we take, why do we take a long time doing worship sometimes? Why do, we, why do we get into a chorus of a song and we just kind of repeat it? And we repeat it, and I would sing one to you, but I, I can't think, I don't do music. And so, but, you know, we, we just, like, we, here we are singing a song again. We've been on this song for five whole minutes. Oh, my gosh. Don't they, do they not know other songs here? Why do we keep singing the same song? The reason that we're still singing that same song is because whoever's leading worship at that moment is saying, wow, I really sense the presence of God on this. For whatever reason, at that moment, the presence of God is, is kissing this moment in this chorus. And so we're going to hang out here, and we're going to trust that the Holy Spirit is using this to just do whatever He needs to do in your life. Because we can do worship that's, okay, this song's going to last two minutes and 43 seconds. We're going to transition. Worship leader is going to say that one, you know, that three, three word little phrase transition to this next song. It's going to last three minutes and 22 seconds. And then we're going to go to this next song and we're going to keep it all in a box. But what if God says, hey, I want to do something different right there? No, 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 no. We've got a schedule to keep. 
Hey, here's the burning bush. Moses, come over, look at the burning bush. No, I have a schedule to keep. Man, when I was a little kid, they came out with, the, with digital watches. You guys, I mean, you guys think I'm old enough that we all had pocket watches, right? Little wind-up jobs. They came out with digital watches when I was like in middle school. And it, it, back, back when, they, it, when it gets to the hour, beep. Right, I remember as a little kid sitting in church, and all of a sudden you beep, beep. And, and there was this one guy, he would sit in the back, and every Sunday, beep, he would do this to the pastor. <laughs> it's time to go. We've got we to gotta beat the Baptist down to Luby's, <laughs> which is a restaurant that's probably out of business now. But I mean, anyway, that's the thing. But... But you see, church, the deal is that it's the presence of God that changes people. I can stand up here and give you messages for days. But the presence of God can change you in a matter of a moment. That one moment where the Holy Spirit says, And what's really weird to me is that I have people come up to me and they go, Man, Pastor, that was a really great message on the the blood of Jesus. And I'm like, I don't think I preached in the blood of Jesus. I thought I was talking about marriage today, but you know, okay. But, it's, but somehow the Holy Spirit takes a, a nugget, a thought, a word, a moment, a testimony, a whatever he wants to, and he takes that and he puts that in your heart and he goes, Pfft. and that's the presence of God, and that's what we're after. I'm not, we're not gimmick focused. Been there, been to the gimmick church. You know, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do chicken soup for the soul this week. Everybody gets chicken soup on the way out. Okay, that's cute. But what about the presence of God? Because the presence of God is what comes in and what changes every one of us. See, I just really believe that if we if we gather and we, we open our hearts to him, and there's an obvious manifestation of his presence that we will we will definitely want to come back. Sort of like what Angela was saying earlier. It's like she, after spending years of not coming to church, she came to church with her family, and it's just like, oh, that's a breath of fresh air. There's something, there's something fresh. There's something that speaks to me. There's something that, that gives life to me, and now I, can't, I can hardly wait for Sunday. I can hardly wait to come together. I can hardly wait for our small group where we're going to worship together and God, and God shows up. We need to be presence-driven, not gimmick-driven. And as a result of this, my, uh, this theory, this philosophy, if you will, my, my understanding is that we should all want to come to church. So as, as a pastor, I don't do a very good job of chasing you down. If you're absent, I notice, unless you sit somewhere different, Janice. You sit somewhere different, and I was like, hey, what are you doing over here? You're sitting in the wrong spot. Linda's all by herself over here. You're sitting somewhere different. I mean, so you mess me up. You sit somewhere. But I notice, and I'll probably, you know, I'll shoot you a text, send you a Facebook message. Hey, I missed you. You guys doing okay? But I am not going to chase you down and hound you. Because if you don't want to be here, then you don't want to be here. Does that make sense? I love this. I love this story. I think it's in Luke uh, Luke 15, it talks about um, the, the shepherd that leaves the 99 to go chase the one, right? And people say, oh, you should chase me. No. I'm not going to chase you because you don't want to be here. You're going to wander off again. You're just gonna, I'm making you unhappy. And you know, in the parable of uh, or the story that Jesus tells about the shepherd leaving to go find the 99, you know, he doesn't ask the one if he wants to come back. He just grabs him by the scruff of the neck, throws him up on his shoulder, and drags him back. And if he wanders off again, he probably breaks his leg or ties a rock around his neck so he can't go anywhere. And you don't want that. You probably call the cops on me if I try to break your leg so you don't wander off again. Right? I think it'd be, a, it'd be assault and battery or something, Right? So what we want is the presence of God is here. I want you to walk in the back door and go, 
Jesus is here. This is so amazing. And Jesus is in your house and he's in your car, but we, we've tried to keep all the disturbances out of the way so that you can walk in and the presence of God manifests and you get from Father what you need. Because there's not, I don't have anything to give you. The Holy Spirit has everything to give you. So we're definitely a church that's interested in His presence. I believe that the power for ministry comes through the presence of God. Not through gimmicking better than somebody else. I was sitting in a pastor's lunch once. We were in the uh, dining room area of the Doubletree Hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma. A bunch of pastors were sitting around talking. And, and this one pastor said, you know, this last weekend, we cooked up fried chicken. And 100 people came from our neighborhood. And we had, you know, we had 30 people give their lives to Christ. And we had all these people come to church the next day. And it was really amazing. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, that's sweet. But the, one of the other pastors in the group said, now what recipe do you use for your fried chicken? I just thought, you've got to be kidding me. Do you think that having the colonel's secret spices are going to somehow grow your church? What you do to get them is what you have to do to keep them. And that applies to all kinds of things. You know, when you go for that job interview and you're, you know, you're walking in and they're like, you know, hey, would you like a muffin? Would you like some coffee? You know, would you like to sit in this really comfy chair? And they, they treat you like that. And then you come back to work and it's like, bring your own breakfast. That's not my job. What they do to get you is what they have to do to keep you. Same applies for dating. I should leave that alone and move on. But if, if, if I have to give you ice cream to make you come to church, then guess what I have to do next week to keep you in church? i got to give you ice cream again. So, so we're not about gimmicks. We're about the presence of God. Where the presence of God manifests, beautiful things happen. Amen? So can we pray? We're going to wrap this up. I think we're going to talk, I'm um, feeling next week we're going to talk about... Uh, Holy Spirit outpouring in the presence of God. We'll see what happens. That's what's been kind of bouncing around in my brain for the last couple of days. So that'll probably be next week. But um, Maestro Ian, can I get you back up on the piano? How many of y'all are freezing cold right now? <laughs> Me too. We should build like take the offering envelopes, make a little campfire, <laughs> or ask Ridge to uh, tap those up one. Because I'm freezing cold and I'm up here moving. So I don't know how that happens. But So let's pray. And, and what I really want to pray about is that we as a church would be healthy as a church. All these things I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. But uh, Sean, it's good to see you back there, by the way. Sean Bear, not Sean, the birthday boy. But um, today is Sean uh, Davidson's birthday, by the way. So everybody give, them, everybody give them spankings on the way out. I think that's how that works. But see, we had a moment, and I just blew it. Zach and I have talked about that. He goes, why do you always do that? It's like, you get, you get a moment, and you just go, I don't know. It just makes me nervous. Can we pray and ask the presence of God just to be so evident in our life and in every part of our ministry? Man, I just want every small group and every time we ever meet to be so amazing. So, Father God, we seek you. And, Father God, we pray right now that your presence would be evident when we speak, when we call each other on the phone, when we, when we hang out together. Father, I know that it's your presence that breaks the yoke. It's your presence that brings deliverance. It's your presence that heals us from addictions. It's your presence that heals us from sickness and disease. It's your presence that brings a joy into our marriages, into our homes. 
heals relationships. So Father God, today we, we come and we say, help us to recognize your presence. Father, I, I, I pray that you would, you would show us how to get the, the humanness of us out of the way so that the divine power of God can manifest in this house. Not because it's a building, but because we are here. Father God, I desire with all of my heart that your presence would manifest in such an amazing Shekinah way that we would, that we would fall before your presence unable to move. That there would be an amazing outpouring of your spirit that would radically change us all. That it would change our thinking. That it would change our, our understanding of possibilities. That it would, it would melt the hardness of our hearts and make us moldable and, and pliable. Father God, we seek you this morning and say, move in our midst. Move in our small groups, Lord. Move when, when college students meet at, at the well and they have, a, they have a soaking time. Move, Father God, at, at the ladies' emerge or the men's breakfast or the men's quarterly meeting. Or Move when two of us meet together at, at Chick-fil-A and, and just talk about you, Father God. We just say move. Father, our desires that your presence will be manifest in our lives. It is not about gimmicks and tricks. and It's about you, Lord. So, Father God, today we recognize that we need you. We need you to touch our minds. We need you to heal our bodies. We need you to give us creative ideas. We need you, Father God, to stir us to make us yours. Father God, we love you today. Oh, we need you more, Lord. Mm. We need you, Lord. We need you more, Lord. Mm. Church, my prayer at this very altar 30-some years ago was, Lord, if you've got more for us, I want it. And that's still my prayer today. And I, and I, I encourage you to make that your prayer. Lord, if you've got more for us, we want it. Lord, if you've got more for us, we want it. Lord, if you've got more for us, we want it. And so move in our presence, Lord. Move and touch. Move and touch. Father, I thank you that in your presence you speak. You speak to us. Mm -hmm. Worthy are you. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Mm. Father, I thank you that in the fullness of your presence there is joy. I thank you that in your presence there is healing. And I thank you that you give us your presence without measure. And you pour it out on us because you love us. Not because we're good, but because you are. Yes, Jesus. Mm. Yes, Jesus. Mm. Yes, Lord. Mm. I'm going to ask you all to just keep this prayer presence focus. And if your eyes are closed, then you can just stay just like you are. I want to address those that are with us for the, maybe the first or second time today. You've come, and, and this church is maybe a little different than anything you've ever been to before. And I say, awesome. That's a, we're excited about that. But if you're, if you're feeling far from God, and, and you, you hear me talking, and we're talking about Jesus who, who loves us and the blood of Jesus that changes us, and you're like, wow, I've not been changed. And may, maybe your guilt and your shame from life is, is weighing you down and just kind of sucking you dry and, and you're ready for a change you're ready to to give your life to the lord in such a way that is transforming that the peace that you so desperately desire will, will manifest because jesus touches you 
If that, that's where you are and you, you hear me talking and you say, Pastor, I need that. I need that transformation. I need, I need Jesus to touch me and I need this to, my life to be different. I'm at the end of my rope. If that's you and you're ready to give your life to the Lord and, and start in a new and awesome way, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to pray for you. And if that's you, you're ready to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to just ask you to just real, real quietly just to raise your hand right where you are and say, that's me. Please pray for me. If that's you, I, I'm ready to have God make my life new and give me a new start and forgive me of my sins. Thanks, man. Awesome. Raise your hand until I see you. Awesome. Thank you, dear. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I see you. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, dear. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Anybody else says today, today, Pastor, I want to start over. I need to clean the slate. I need to start anew. Jesus, touch my life. Mm. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, white sweater. Yes, I see you. Awesome. Awesome. Church, can we all pray together? We're going we're gonna to pray a prayer of dedication to the Lord, and I just feel the presence of God all over this. And we're just, I'm going to ask you guys all to pray with us, and we're going to do that in support of the six people that I saw raise their hands. And we're going to pray a prayer that is like this. Repeat this with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all wrongdoing. And give me a new relationship with you. I thank you that today I can start over. And you make me new. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Awesome. Those who raised your hand this morning, I'm going to ask if you would, please, if you would meet my wife over here by the grand piano as soon as we dismiss, and she will uh, get your name and talk with you and pray over you. If you have any needs, she'd be happy to, to meet with you um, over here afterwards. So um, can we give it up for uh, six people that I saw raise their hands this morning?